Well, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Uh, very happy to be part of this symposium honoring Jim Waters. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate. Uh, I met Jim a number of times, and uh, he was certainly a, a very uh, great entrepreneur, also a strong scientist, and uh, really dedicated his life to, to building instruments that helped other scientists solve some of the most important problems of our day. And uh, so certainly it's fitting to, to honor him and his contributions to our, our field and to the world, really. So today we'll talk about the history of SFCMS, just a, a few slides, and then we'll uh, really focus on some of the big changes that uh, made all the difference in the world for SFCMS in terms of its applicability and uh, the ease of use, uh, such as atmospheric pressure ionization. We'll uh, talk about the challenges in, in pressure regulation and flow splitting and how people have addressed that in different ways over the years. I'll share with you some of the work that we did and others did pushing the extremes of, of SFCMS. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the additives and how they've made a, a world of difference in, in analyzing more polar ionic uh, analytes in SFCMS. And finally, we'll finish up with talking about some recent work uh, in modeling, uh, modeling the, the current interfaces that are out there and available and understanding their, um, their impact and, and how they can be used, best used. And finally, we'll, we'll say just a few words about what I think about the future of SFCMS. So you might wonder where I got the title from my talk. And uh, to be honest, I, I stole it, or at least it was inspired by Patrick Arpino. Uh, you may recall back in 74, uh, Patrick and, and Bobby Dawkins and Fred McLafferty published the first online uh, description of LCMS, online LCMS, uh, a fantastic paper. Uh, very impressive. And then a few years later in 82, Patrick uh, published another uh, paper uh, and he waxed a bit more philosophical about LCMS and, and how difficult it was, the challenges. And he likened it uh, to a courtship between a fish and a bird. So as I read this paper and reread it, uh, I, I thought, well, perhaps uh, uh, it, it would be fitting to, to think of the analytes in SFC is being more like flying fish because they're dissolved in a, a, a very dense a gas, a, a dense fluid rather than a liquid. So as I thought about my title, I realized it, it might be a little misleading because as one uh, moves from the uh, dense gas, uh, high pressure supercritical fluid state and um, drop the pressure as you move toward the mass spectrometer, uh, the density of the fluid drops, and these flying fish don't want to remain solvated. They want to become rocks, uh, little rocks. And uh, of course, as a little rock, it's difficult to become a bird. Uh, and uh, so that's really the challenge, isn't it, of, of SFCMS? And, uh, and that's why those who have overcome this challenge and looking at different kinds of interfaces and uh, have been able to, to accomplish this, to move from the flying fish state to the bird state in the mass spectrometer. So a little history. Um, back in 1969, Thomas Milne was the first to publish at least a proposal to uh, use dense gases, solvation in dense gases, to move non-volatile analytes into a mass spectrometer and to obtain spectra. But it was uh, Randall and Varhaftik in 1978 who published the first actual uh, dense gas chromatography, as they called it, uh, uh, SFC, supercritical fluid chromatography, uh, mass spectrometry. They used uh, an uncoated, uh, long uh, stainless steel capillary, uh, uh, and then they, they used ethane and carbon dioxide and other mobile phases. Um, they were not actually able to show separations, but they did get spectra, and so that was a, a good first start, certainly. But it was in, not until 1982, really with the advent of open tubular fused silica uh, capillary columns that allowed uh, the really first successful SFCMS. Uh, the low flow rates uh, coming out of the open tubular columns uh, were introduced into a standard uh, chemical ionization source. Uh, by, and then the publication was by Dick Smith, Dale Felix, John Felstead, and our very own Milton Lee, who's part of our symposium today. Uh, and they were able to show some very nice spectra, very nice uh, chromatograms. Here, for example, are some 
polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons uh, and very impressive work early on. A number of other labs then jumped into uh, SFC, uh, SFCMS, including our own. Uh, we worked very hard to characterize different kinds of flow restrictors. We built our own instruments. Uh, we built many uh, interfaces. Uh, here on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see some, one of the many interfaces we built uh, to couple open tubular uh, SFC to, to mass spectrometry. Um, we added pumping, for example, larger turbo pumps. We had here's an here's some here's a diagram of the cryo pumping experiment we did where we added uh, three big cryo pumps to allow the better pumping of the flow of the flows coming out of the SFC column. Uh, and we were able to do a lot of uh, great work, uh, solve many problems for the, our employer uh, back then, Procter and Gamble. Uh, and so, for example, here are, uh, is our spec is a spectrum of uh, uh, sucrose octaester. This was the product back then called Olean, which uh, uh, that's a whole other story. But uh, it was a it was a very challenging uh, molecule uh, or mixture to, to characterize analytically. And SFC and SFCMS were, were really very helpful. And in fact, uh, for a long time, SFC was the, the method to characterize these, uh, these sucrose uh, octaester mixtures. And here are just a few examples of some of the contributions of others uh, and, and of our uh, lab uh, to both open tubular and pack column SFC MS uh, over the next few years. People looking at uh, trying to generate electron impact and electron ionization spectra uh, that would be library searchable, uh, and uh, so and also for example in pack column SFC MS uh, people using the uh, interfaces that are similar to those that were being used at the time for uh, for liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry such as the thermal spray interface you remember that perhaps and the particle beam interface in Taylor's lab some very nice results there. But when it comes to milestones, probably the single biggest jump forward was the introduction of atmospheric pressure ionization. It really made all the difference in the world. So there was the world before API and the world after API. So in 1990, uh, Eric Wong and Jack Henyon, Tom Covey uh, published the first work of, of SFC uh, introduced into an atmospheric pressure ionization source. Here they were using APCI, atmospheric pressure chemical ionization. And uh, they, they produce some nice separations, some very impressive uh, uh, sensitivities. Here's uh, for a, this is a pharmaceutical a chromatogram of a pharmaceutical extracted from bovine liver tissue uh, at a 20 part per billion level in the tissue. So a very impressive work there. And then in 93, uh, Sadun Verlisier and Patrick Jalapino, the same Patrick Jalapino we've spoken of already, uh, published uh, SFC introduced into an electrospray ion source and again showed uh, chromatograms and, and nice spectrum. And then a couple of years later, uh, back in 1995, Tim Baker and I described uh, electrospray, uh, pneumatically assisted electrospray ionization for SFCMS. And there we had three concentric flows. We had the effluent from the SFC column and a nebulizing gas and also a sheath flow liquid and we could modify the sheath flow liquid to enhance ionization so uh, and of course the the nebulizing gas really did help with the evaporation of larger flows um, in 98 we started off with open tubular sfc but then uh, shifted gradually over to pack column sfc here's uh, some examples of chromatograms we published in 98 uh, showing uh, chiral separations of uh, ketorolac and derivatives of ketorolac. This is an anti-inflammatory also extracted from, from tissue. And I failed to mention in the previous slide that the sheath flow liquid really was important because without introducing some kind of organic solvent, you got no ionization at all with pure CO2 in electrospray uh, a source, uh, which I guess makes perfect sense if you understand the mechanism of ionization and electrospray that involves charged droplets. But uh, coming to, to the present slide, um, in SFC, of course, it's important to maintain the entire system above some minimum pressure. Uh, 
because below that pressure, you get boiling of the mobile phase. You get two phases, and at least traditionally, that's not how we do chromatography. We'd prefer to have a single phase in the mobile phase. Uh, so how best to regulate pressure, uh, especially with uh, PAC column SFC, where the flows are much higher? Uh, do we use a mechanical back pressure regulating valve, uh, perhaps a, a couple of different stages of restriction, maybe a fixed restrictor and a mechanical variable restrictor. Uh, or I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the idea that we had of using a pressure regulating fluid, an actual fluid to regulate foot pressure. And then oftentimes the flows coming out of a pack column system are, are too high to introduce into uh, certain kinds of ion sources. So do you do flow splitting uh, before the back pressure regulator or after? Uh, or is it even possible to do total flow introduction? That is, put the entire effluent into the mass spectrometer. And here's a cartoon of the probably what was and maybe even is today still the most common way of, inter of interfacing SFC to mass spectrometry. And that's the uh, by, by putting a, a, a T, basically a, a leak uh, in the system just after the column and before the back pressure regulator. And I'll call that the, the pre-BPR flow splitting approach. Um, part of the challenges here is that you have a, a restrictor, a, a small capillary going all the way to the mass spectrometer, to the electrospray interface. So you still have to have some kind of flow restriction to maintain the pressure in that line, in that transfer line, and, and to, to keep analytes in solution and, and a dense fluid. Um, one nice thing about using electrospray interface uh, ionization in, in this uh, type of uh, interface is that the electrospray ionization, as you probably know, is, is concentration sensitive. So even though most of the effluent and most of the analytes are move, moving through the back pressure weight regulator, you still get good signals on electrospray ionization with this approach. Here's some nice work done using the pre BPR flow splitting approach by Ben Bolaños and Manny Ventura and Michael Grieg back then they were at Pfizer. And here they're uh, taking advantage of the high speed separations available or possible in SFC. Um, and all, uh, really what they're doing here is, is comparing uh, the results they obtain with a relatively slow scanning quadrupole mass spectrometer to a time of flight, which of course can acquire spectra much more rapidly than a, than a slower scanning instrument. Uh, and here you can see this region around uh, uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 minutes. You see two nicely resolved peaks versus a single peak in the quadrupole, the slower scanning uh, system. So the chromatographic fidelity is much better in the time of flight uh, with the time of flight instrument. Um, and here's a, another impressive separation they showed here in a scan, a matter of just about six seconds, they showed four nicely resolved uh, peaks. So uh, what I would call an extreme the separation certainly for the time it was very extreme. Uh, here's an illustration of one of our first successful approaches to do total flow introduction in SFCMS. And uh, as you think about moving the effluent from the column to the mass spectrometer, uh, anything it goes through has to be very low dead volume or else you get band broadening and, and poor chromatographic fidelity. In this case, the pressure back pressure regulator had indeed low uh, dead volume, but we found that the pressure transducer, which was in line with this instrument in this instrument in, in the chromatographic flow at this point, uh, had a very large dead volume. So we had to remove it from the flow path and to prevent uh, things from backing up, uh, analytes from backing up into the pressure transducer, we actually uh, introduced a, a low flow uh, coming from a pump under flow control uh, to sweep this dead volume. And, and the other advantage of having that flow is we could add a little bit of acid or a little bit of uh, base or, or uh, uh, salt to improve ionization, to improve the, the actual ionization process. Here's an illustration of a, of a novel approach uh, to regulate pressure post-column. And frankly, I have to give credit to my colleague and friend, Tom Chester, who came up with this idea to use a, a pump under pressure control to regulate pressure at this T point after the column and before the mass spectrometer. Now, one of the advantages of this approach is you could put that pressure regulating T right up next to the mass spectrometer. So you had very, relatively small uh, transfer line uh, to, to deal with, that, that was good. Um, 
and we used this for many years and, and were very successful in using it. The challenge is that the, the pump that we're using was not under the control of the chromatographic system. So you had two different, uh, basically, computers controlling different aspects of, of the system. And, and the other challenge was that uh, the transfer line and, and the restrictor, essentially, after the pressure regulating T could accommodate a certain flow, but if, if you wanted to go up to higher pressures, that is introducing more fluid from the pump, or if you wanted to go to lower flows on the column, uh, you had to change this, uh, this transfer line, and it would only accommodate a certain range of flow rates, uh, or else you would, you would basically swamp out the mass spectrometer. Uh, so while we, we again used it for lots of uh, good stuff over the years, it was not what I'd call uh, very uh, uh, user-friendly. But the pressure regulating fluid interface did provide great chromatographic fidelity, as you can imagine, very, low, very, very low dead volume. Uh, here's a comparison of uh, two isomers separated using the direct fluid introduction approach with a mechanical back pressure regulating uh, device compared to the pressure regulating fluid interface. And you, could, you could see better uh, chromatographic resolution using the PRF interface. Now here's an example of what I'll call some extreme SFCMS using the PRF interface. Um, here we're doing separations of uh, some very complex polymers. We're, doing, we're using ammonia CI, so you can see ammonia, ammonia adduct ion spectra below. Uh, here we're using longer columns. Uh, this particular separation was using a one meter column, but we often used one and a half, even two meter columns for these, this work, depending upon what we were trying to separate. Uh, we're also using relatively high temperatures. Uh, this separation was at 100 degrees C. We would often go 120, 130, 150 C, depending upon what we were trying to separate. And as long as the analytes and the column were stable at those temperatures, we, we were able to use those temperatures for, for many, many separations for many months. Uh, these were uh, soil, soil release polymers, uh, polymers that uh, P&G chemists were developing that would go into uh, high-end laundry detergents, liquid laundry detergents, such as liquid Tide, and they would lay down on the clothes and prevent uh, dirt from depositing upon your clothes. So the more times you washed your clothes, the, clo uh, the cleaner your clothes stayed. And here's a, a 3D plot of that same separation of mass to charge on the y-axis, retention time on the x, and intensity coming out in the colored uh, uh, plot that you see. Uh, fairly complex mixture, so we were helping, uh, helping our chemist friends understand what they were making. Uh, one thing, of course, that I failed to mention in the previous slide is that as you're uh, adding column length uh, to get more plates, you're also paying for that with time. So this separation was certainly up to about an hour in length. But if you uh, go to a zoom in on that little box, You'll see some very characteristic patterns, and we use these patterns to help us understand what we were looking at. Uh, these were propoxylate, ethoxylate, and then capped uh, polymers. So different caps would have uh, come in different areas. Uh, as you would move from a propoxylate and replace it to, with an ethoxylate, you'd move to a different zone. And of course, the, the capping, there were some that were monocaps, some that were di, some that were tri, and you see uh, you'd see different uh, different bands in the uh, 3D chromatogram that way. So then we thought about going back to a passive restrictor, getting rid of the mechanical back pressure regulator altogether uh, for high speed separations, uh, really back to what we would used to use in open tubular SFCMS. Um, and this worked and works uh, under certain conditions, uh, as long as the flows and the dimensions of the, this transfer line, this restrictor, are such that the pressure is always above that two-phase transition point where you get boiling in the mobile phase, and also for separations where pressure itself has little effect on the separation. And generally, that's the case when the modifier content is high, say 30% or more. When I say modifier, I'm talking about an organic solvent, uh, methanol, something like that, that one would add to the carbon dioxide mobile phase. And the col column temperature is relatively low. And many uh, separations of pharmaceuticals uh, are, that are important in that world are in fact done uh, near room temperature or just slightly above room temperature. Uh, 
And so uh, the, this approach uh, of using no back pressure regulator does work and works well for uh, uh, certain, for bioanalytical routine separations, for example. Here's an example of work we did uh, using this approach, this uh, no mechanical back pressure regulating device for total flow introduction in SFCMS. And here we're separating all of the wells of a 96 well plate uh, in less than 10 minutes. At the time, this was a, a record in terms of speed for a 96 well plate. Um, and you can see here the entire, uh, all of the chromatograms for, for the plate in less than 10 minutes. Um, these plates contained dextromethorphan with a D3 uh, deuterated dextromethorphan as internal standard. And here are chromatograms of one row from that plate. And then we're going to blow up a couple of chromatograms here. You can see that there, we are doing chromatography, uh, a reasonable K prime. And we were separating the peak of interest, uh, the, the dextromethorphan, from the void volume and, and analyte suppression for other things that were uh, eluding at that point. So we're, we're, doing, uh, we're doing actual chromatography here in a matter of about six seconds. And I wish I had a picture of the, this instrument because it was quite a, 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 an amazing device. You, you had uh, eight injectors that were all lined up uh, in, together and they would be all loaded at the same time. Then every five seconds, a different injector would, would shoot, would fire and, and send its contents onto the column onto a very short uh, chromatographic column running at very high speeds, so about four mils per minute, as I recall correctly. So now I'll turn my attention to additives. Um, those of you who are familiar with SFC know that it's common with modern SFC to mix an, a polar organic solvent, something like methanol or ethanol, something like that, in with the carbon dioxide mobile phase. And that in itself made a huge difference in the range of applicability of SFC. Uh, but really, I think that the real breakout uh, milestone, the, the things that's made, made a huge difference, is the introduction of additives, what we will call additives, or what we call additives. Um, and there, these are uh, acids, typically bases and, and salts, uh, other things that are introduced at very low levels, uh, even millimolar levels, into the organic solvent that is then mixed with the carbon dioxide. And here's an example of the discovery of, of this ammonium acetate as an additive. Uh, of course, we were using ammonium acetate in LC, LCMS commonly, but had not thought about using it for SFC. Um, and uh, I thought about the idea, we, we, we were trying to compare the applicability of SFCMS to uh, looking at the incoming, the receipts for the PNG Pharmaceutical Library uh, repository. And uh, there was a routine um, universal LCMS method that was being used day in and day out, 24-7 to uh, look at the quality of these receipts that, that P&G Pharmaceuticals was buying at the time. And we thought perhaps by using SFC, we could speed things up by a factor of three to five, which is not uncommon uh, when you move from LC to SFC. And of course, the selectivity is also different, so that's, that's a nice thing to have. Um, but we found early on that we were seeing lots and lots of cases of, of uh, analytes that we were not seeing by SFCMS. And so I, I suggested that we add a little bit of ammonium acetate to the methanol modifier. And many of my colleagues weren't real keen about the idea because they thought it might plug things up. But we went ahead and tried it and uh, it made all the difference in the world. All of a sudden, as you can see here, uh, relatively polar molecule reserpine. Uh, without the uh, ammonium acetate in the top chromatogram, and you see nothing, no, not eluted at all. And then in the lower chromatogram, you can see a nice clean peak. And so we then moved on, and eventually every separation we made by SFC uh, contained a little bit of ammonium acetate, just a few millimolar. Um, and it seemed like it would help in some cases, and it didn't hurt in others. Uh, here's one slide showing the results of that comparison between that universal uh, LCMS method and the uh, SFCMS method using ammonium acetate as an additive. We picked uh, over 2,000 compounds that were designed to represent the, the whole world drug index at the time. And they represented, the, this group of molecules represented all kinds of things, some very nonpolar 
uh, aliphatics to, to very polar multiphosphonates, uh, of course, polyhydroxies, uh, multisulfonates. Um, the uh, ruggedness of the two methods was, was about equivalent. Uh, in fact, uh, the colleagues in the lab seemed to prefer the SFCMS method because they said they had to clean the ion source less often. Uh, and uh, hopefully you can see this on your slide. That the number of hits by SFCMS was about 75% and by LCMS was just a little higher. But if you added what we would consider uh, total hits and strong signal, that is uh, signals that were uh, similar to what you expected, two mass units higher, two mass units lower, maybe 16 mass units higher, were certainly related to the molecule that was supposed to be in that little vial that, that PNG, P, PNG Pharma had bought, but wasn't exactly the what, what was expected. Uh, both systems were up close to 90% in terms of their ability to, to see uh, those molecules, to detect those molecules. Um, we Interestingly, you had about 4% of things that you could see by SFCMS that were not seen by LCMS, and about 8%, uh, about double that number that were seen by LCMS that were not uh, hits by SFCMS. So an interesting comparison. So a great deal of effort over the years has gone into looking at other kinds of additives in SFC, SFCMS. Uh, of course, uh, as we already talked about ammonium acetate, but ammonium hydroxide, very useful for, for preparatory scale, preparative scale separations. Even small levels, low levels of water uh, in Taylor's group, for example. I wanted to show these two uh, publications because just to show how many years uh, this interest in, in water has been around from a publication in 86 by, by Dick Smith and colleagues, uh, then one here from 2020. Uh, by Govinder and colleagues uh, look using low levels of water to separate, separate uh, human insulin. Uh, here's a publication where the uh, small amount of water and methane sulfonic acid are used as additives uh, to look at uh, separations of, of peptides in 2021. Now here's some work we did with water soluble uh, hydrophilic peptides, uh, the largest which, one of which was about 4,600 Daltons in mass, and uh, we're using a little bit of trifluoroacetic acid, made a huge difference in the elution and peak shape of these, uh, these peptides. In, in terms of milestones, I wanted to make sure and mention this work by Takeshi Bamba and his uh, colleagues at Kyushu University, where they're really bridging the differences between SFC and LC. Here in a single separation, they're showing uh, fat-soluble and water-soluble vitamins uh, moving all the way from SFC, a 2% uh, modifier in the carbon dioxide, all the way up to 100% modifier, so to speak, a liquid mobile phase. Here they're using 0.2% ammonium formate in methanol as, uh, with a little bit of water in it again. So that combination we see over and over again, methanol with a little bit of water with, with an additive being very helpful in SFC MS separations. Another big milestone, really milestones, were the introductions of uh, well integrated, reliable, and user friendly instruments from major manufacturers. Uh, interestingly, here, Waters on the top left part of the slide is using the, the pre, pre BPR splitting approach in terms of interfacing. Shimazu uh, on the bottom of the slide is using a direct fluid introduction approach, no splitting. Uh, and Agilent, uh, interestingly, is really uh, provides both, either, either the pre-BPR or total flow introduction, whichever one the user wants to, to use. Another milestone I wanted to bring your attention to was this uh, really landmark modeling work done by uh, Davi Guillaume and his colleagues at the University of Geneva and also the University in Lyon. Um, and here in this work, they were modeling the behavior of the three modern uh, commercial uh, SFCMS interfaces. Uh, Waters is at the top of this matrix and on the top line, Agilent, and then at the bottom, Shimazu. And this uh, shows the actual introduction of methanol, uh, the modifier that they was chosen for the modeling work into the mass spectrometer. Uh, the right, the leftmost, excuse me, the leftmost 
column is with no modifier, uh, just a sheath flow liquid uh, of mod mod methanol going into the flow of, of effluent. The, the middle uh, column is at 20% methanol modifier and the rightmost column at 40% modifier. So rel relatively reasonable uh, parameters that they chose. And you can see that the total amount of methanol going into the mass spectrometer differs, differs dramatically depending upon the conditions that you're, you're choosing and, the, and depending upon the interface. And here's a table summarizing the results. You can see that they found that electrospray was most compatible with the pre-BPR splitting approach, whereas APCI was probably best with the total flow introduction with no splitting at all. So I promised you a little glimpse of the future of SFCMS. Um, I think we'll see more work understanding the advantages and disadvantages of various interfaces, such as we saw with Guillaume and colleagues. Uh, there'll be wider use of more people being able to bring the advantages of SFC uh, into their application areas and because there's less expertise now required for success. Uh, there'll be more routine, more compendial res uh, applications, more separations, and we're actually seeing that uh, those, these publications appear. Uh, there'll be a wider range of applications. There'll be even maybe a small RNA uh, separations, uh, proteins, uh, ionic analytes, perhaps uh, inorganic ionics, uh, who, never, who knows? I wanted to bring your attention to this uh, recent publication at the top of the slide uh, in Trends in Analytical Chemistry back in, in just in 2022. So thank you for your attention. Again, thank you for the ability to be part of this uh, symposium, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there's time.